Hey everyone, I created a second channel where I'll be uploading true slash creepy stories from around the internet such as Reddit. If you enjoy using that kind of content to fall asleep or just have on in the background, feel free to subscribe to it. I will link it in the description. Welcome back to the Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg. Today we're continuing layer 2 and for anyone who is new, this iceberg has over 1000 total entries and we only recently finished the first layer. I'll link the playlist with all previous parts in the description for you to watch as well. So without further ado, let's begin. To kick off part 7, our first entry takes place in 1960 in Finland where a woman named Hilka Saarinen went missing before being found inside an oven. And since this is an incident that took place in Finland, there are going to be names that I probably completely mess up, so apologies for any mispronunciations. Hilka was 33 years old when she went missing and was living with her husband named Penti in a large wooden house that she inherited from her grandparents. The couple had five children, but due to the father's violent habits, all of them were taken away by the states and put into foster homes. And as you can probably guess, Hilka was also a victim of Penty's violent outbursts. On numerous occasions, Penty returned home heavily drunk to beat his wife and threaten her that he would kill her in a way that can't be traced. On December 25th, the couple's eldest son decided to visit home with a classmate. However, he told his parents that he'd be arriving on the 26th. When the boys stepped through the unlocked door, they found Penty stepping out of the kitchen and locking the door behind him. When Penty saw that the boys arrived early, he began mumbling to himself, wondering why they came ahead of schedule. The son asked where his mother was, and Penty answered by saying she had left the previous night while he was asleep. Throughout the boys' stay, Penty exhibited signs of nervousness and paranoia and they would also notice that on his knuckles there was a noticeable scrape. But the strangest thing was that Penty seemed completely unbothered by the disappearance of his wife. As a result, the son's classmate decided to leave early as he began to fear that Penty had done something very sinister. Over the years, the son would revisit his parents' home a number of times and investigate in order to find some sort of clue as to what had happened to his mother. In 1966, the son sent a letter to the police that said, I suspect that my father knows more about the disappearance of my mother than he has told me. He has clearly opened the oven and shut it again. However, the oven had not been used in 7-8 to eight years before this. My father was cleaning in the dark even though another room was lit. I think the oven should be dismantled. My father could do anything. But unfortunately, the police would disregard the letter. In another attempt to get the attention of the police, the son wrote an article that was issued in a magazine in 1967 titled, I Suspect My Father Is A Murderer. Sometime after the article was published, the father and son met and Penty simply said, let's both just mind our own business. It wasn't until 1972 where police were ordered to go through past cold cases that this incident would be revisited. Authorities went to Penty's home and they dismantled the family's oven. During this time, Penty had been moved to a police station. Inside the oven, police found that it was completely filled with sand and buried about 4 feet deep was the mummified head of a woman. Further digging yielded the entire body and the son would identify it as his mother. Penty was taken to court where it was determined that he did not intentionally cause his wife's death and he was sentenced to 8 years in prison. However, he would only serve 1 year of his sentence. Reason being was that the Supreme Court would revisit his case and they claimed that neither the cause nor manner of Hilka's death was known and one could no longer be sentenced for accidental killings after 12 years. And today the case is still marked as unresolved. As a part of the Apollo 10 mission, three NASA astronauts were tasked with circling the moon to test the spacecraft's lunar lander module. You can basically think of this as a practice run or dress rehearsal to the Apollo 11 mission, which was the actual moon landing. And as far as we know, the mission was reported to have gone smoothly, except it wasn't actually that smooth. When the Apollo 11 spacecraft reached the dark side of the moon, it lost contact with mission control and supposedly the astronauts on board heard an eerie quote unquote outer space type music. That was the official account of Eugene Cernan who was one of the astronauts on board. You would think that a strange incident like this would be reported but the astronauts instead chose to downplay it, probably in order to avoid any questioning towards their mental health as any sort of crack in their mental fortitude would have had the potential to ruin their careers. The sounds were later described as whistling and wooing sounds with an occasional howling noise. 
One of the early theories suggests that the sounds the astronauts heard were simply static noises from a magnetic field or atmospheric interference with the radios. But this was quickly disproven as the moon has no magnetic field or atmosphere to mess with the lunar radios. NASA's public explanation simply said that the radios on the command and lunar modules were interfering with each other, which resulted in the unusual noise. But of course, being that this topic does involve outer space, there are many enthusiasts that disagree with NASA's reasoning and say that that it was something else causing the noise. Richard John Bingham, or more commonly known as Lord Lucan, was a British peer who suddenly disappeared after being suspected of murder. Lucan developed a liking towards gambling, ultimately becoming an early member of a gambling group exclusive to the rich and elite at the Claremont Club. Lucan was well known for his expensive lifestyle, racing powerboats, and driving high-end vehicles. And due to this, he was even considered for a James Bond role when the original novels were going through their first cinematic adaptation. Lucan married a woman named Veronica Duncan in 1963, but they would begin the process of divorce in 1972. A bitter custody battle followed which resulted in Lucan's loss. Lucan was immensely furious at this and obsessed over regaining custody of the children. Supposedly, he spied on his wife and listened in on her telephone conversations as well. This mental and emotional strain on top of the legal expenses and gambling losses drove Lucan to a delirious state of living. In November of 1974, Sandra Rivet, who is the the nanny of Lucan's children was found bludgeoned to death in the kitchen of the family home. Authorities found no signs of forced entry, but they did discover a bloodstained towel in Veronica's first floor bedroom, as well as an immense amount of blood on the basement staircase. Near Rivet's body, a bloodstained pipe was also found. Police were already aware of the tension between Veronica and Lucan, so they visited Lucan's last known address where they didn't find anything unusual. His bed was well kept, his Mercedes was parked outside with his engine still cold, and his passport was in his bedside drawer. Besides Lucan, Rivet's estranged husband and other male friends were also questioned, all of which would ultimately be discounted as suspects. This now left the missing Lucan to be questioned. It was found that Lucan had called his mother before and after the death of Sandra Rivet. In the second call, he told his mother that something had happened at Veronica's home and she should go pick up the children. Authorities also realized that Lucan fled to a friend's residence that was located in East Sussex a few hours after the murder. While while there, only his friend's wife, whose name is Susan, was present. Lucan wrote two letters and left them with Susan before leaving. And if you'd like to read through the letters in their entirety, feel free to pause the video. But basically, they just suggest that Lucan was framed for the murder of Sandra. By the time police had issued a public announcement for his arrest, Lucan had already vanished. His vehicle was found abandoned in New Haven, where its interior was completely stained with blood. Additionally, inside the trunk of the car, there was a lead pipe wrapped in bandages similar to the one found at the crime scene. During an inquest that was held in 1975, the jury came to the verdict that Lucan was the one who killed Sandra Rivet. Over the years, there have been hundreds of alleged sightings of Lucan, none of which have been substantiated. And despite all of the press coverage and manpower invested into the investigation, Lucan was never found. So Lucan's true fate after the murder of Sandra Rivet remains a mystery. And of course, according to Lucan, he was framed, and we don't really know the details of who tried to frame him if that indeed is true. Cannibal Holocaust is an Italian found footage horror film from 1980. And as you can probably guess from the name, this film garnered immense controversy. Despite having some pretty gnarly scenes containing animal cruelty, racism, and mastication, the film has a pretty loyal cult-like following. If you have never heard of the film, it focuses on a rescue mission in the Amazon rainforest where a crew of filmmakers have gone missing. The rescue team eventually stumbles across the footage from the filmmakers and TV stations want to broadcast it as a sensationalized special. The various scenes in the film are shot in such a way that many believe that they were actually real. Film historians struggle nowadays, but continue to try and separate the fact from fiction in regards to this film. One of these historians named Callum Waddle mentioned a lost slash unfinished torture scene that involved slowly dipping a person into a piranha infested river. 
To my knowledge, there has only ever been one image of this scene that has ever surfaced, and I'm 110% going to get age restricted or even worse if I show it no matter how many ways I try to censor it, so if you do want to view it, simply searching the name of this entry will bring it up. As I mentioned earlier, some of these scenes were pretty convincing, and when this image surfaced, people began losing their minds thinking the film crew actually subjected a man to this torture. But what really happened was apparently a local who already lost his leg was tied to the wooden log and simply had piranha props stitched to his leg. As of today, the complete contents and whereabouts of the scene are a mystery. Bermeja is a phantom island that is supposedly located near the north coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. The island was mapped by significant Spanish cartographers sometime during the 16th century. However, during a number of studies and surveys from 1997 to 2009, the island was never found. The island has even served as a marker of sorts for Mexico's 200 nautical mile economic zone during the 1970s. In 1997, when a naval fishing crew went looking for the island, they were baffled when they couldn't locate it. And as I just said before, there were numerous expeditions and studies involving the island, but it had seemingly vanished. Many people think that the island never actually existed and those early cartographers simply made a mistake when mapping. Either they misplaced Bermeja and it does actually exist just in a different location, or they outright mistakenly placed a mass of land where there was none. Another theory suggests that the island had been taken over by water. Being that no one has actually seen the island, it may have been swallowed up by the rising sea levels over the centuries. And then there's a bit more of a far-fetched theory involving the CIA where they supposedly destroyed the island in order to get an economic advantage in the area. For about two decades, Charles Peck had been working as a customer service agent for Delta Airlines at the Salt Lake City International Airport. However, Charles had decided to move on from that chapter of his life and wanted a change in scenery. So in September of 2008, he decided to move in with his fiancée, Andrea, who was living in California at the time. Charles purchased a plane ticket to Los Angeles, and once he arrived, he boarded the Metrolink to meet Andrea, who was supposed to pick him up. The Metro was originally scheduled to arrive at Andrea's location at about 4.45 p.m. Unfortunately, this train ride resulted in a tragedy. The engineer in charge of the helm had been texting while on the job, which caused the metro to miss a stop signal and collide into a freight train traveling at high speeds in the opposite direction. Charles's fiance caught wind of the accident and rushed to the location to hopefully find Charles alive. When she went to grab her cell phone to call Charles, she saw a number of missed calls from his number. Various friends and family of Charles would also later report that they received calls from him as well. The number of calls totaled to a little over 35, but oddly enough, the calls didn't actually have a voice or anything. Instead, it was just static. At first, they thought that this may have been Charles reaching out for help and that he was too weak from injuries to yell out. The calls would continue up until 3am the next morning. Eventually, firefighters did discover Charles, but sadly, he did not survive the accident. But the strangest thing was that medics determined that he had died on impact, or at the very least, it was immensely unlikely that he survived the initial impact, so he shouldn't have been able to make those phone calls, which had been going on for about 10-11 to 11 hours. When the public caught wind of Charles' strange phone calls, many would chalk it up to be some sort of paranormal event. Paranormal enthusiasts typically call this type of event a crisis apparition. The dying will to communicate with friends or family one last time before passing away is so strong that deceased individuals will somehow tether themselves to the real world to speak with their loved ones. But many others argue that the phone calls were a result of some sort of disturbed trolling by sick individuals who had come across Charles's corpse and phone. Another suggestion is that this may have just been some sort of malfunction in the phone itself, which at first may seem like the most rational explanation, but it's still unusual that only the closest people to Charles were contacted, and as far as I know, I don't think Charles's phone was actually ever found.
The Butcher of Mons is the name given to an unidentified serial killer who committed five murders during 1996 and 97 in the Belgian city of Mons. On March 22, 1997, a police officer named Oliver Motz was going on his daily patrol on horseback in Mons where he discovered a pile of eight garbage bags. Expecting them to simply be filled with trash, he would get off his horse and pick them up before realizing that they instead carried human body parts. Investigators determined that the limbs inside the bag belonged to three different women. On the 23rd and 24th, two more bags were found on the same street as the previous ones, one of which contained a torso of a woman. And on April 12th, another two bags were discovered and within them, there was a foot, a leg, and a head. The systematic mutilation of the bodies made the process of identifying them extremely difficult. But authorities ultimately determined the victims to be the following, and apologies, I'm probably going to mispronounce at least half of these names. The victims were Carmelina Russo, Martine Bon, Jacqueline Leclerc, Natalie Godart, and Begonia Valencia. The body parts that were left behind didn't help in identifying the culprit, but one of the suspects was a man named Smail Tolja, who killed someone in Albania before cutting them up and disposing of them in a garbage bag. On another occasion in Brooklyn, New York, he was caught red-handed disposing of garbage bags that contained the remains of a woman named Mary Beale. Tolja did flee the US and it's believed that one of his destinations was Belgium. Authorities would dismiss the possibility that Tolja was the Butcher of Mons as he was said to have lived too far from Mons during his stay in Belgium. And ultimately, authorities didn't bother chasing Tolja to question him as he was in another country completely. Another theory suggests that the victims were from a mental health institution and either a resident or employee from within killed them. When investigators looked into the backgrounds of the victims, they found that all of them were committed to the same institution. But authorities only briefly considered this possibility before giving up on it as it seemed the investigation team as a whole was kind of disinterested in the case, so they didn't bother pursuing this lead at all. In the German National Forest of Kottenfoss, there is a strange old iron pillar that is partially buried in the ground. It's about 2.2 meters long and about 1 meter of it is underground. And the very first mention of the object dates all the way back to a 17th century document that may suggest that it was a boundary marker. But nobody knows for certain what its origin is or what its purpose was. The rough surface on the pillar is a result of using the sand bed pouring technique which was a popular method during the late middle ages. The document that mentioned the pillar hinted that it was part of a borderline along the Roman aqueduct, and sometime in 1717 it was moved but we are not sure where to. Then in 1727 a prince had it placed in its current location where it serves as a popular meeting point for hikers. Personally though I do think we already know the answer to this mystery, more than likely it really just was some sort of visual designation used at some earlier point in history and people just trying to come up with some sort of more exciting backstory for the object. If you're a fan of the Barely Sociable YouTube channel, you have likely heard of this incident. The Mount Asahidake incident involved some missing hikers near the mountain in July of 1989. Helicopter pilots noticed a huge SOS sign laid out on the ground that was made of birch logs. Each letter was about 16 feet long and 10 feet wide. About two miles north of the sign, the rescue team found the hikers. When the team dropped the hikers off at a hospital, they were questioned about the SOS sign. Shockingly, the hikers said that they had no idea what they were talking about. They didn't create any sort of sign. Hokkaido police immediately decided to visit the sign, suspecting that there may be more people still lost near the mountain. Nearby the sign, police found a human skeleton with bite marks left behind by animals. The skeleton was determined to be that of a male and prior to his death, a number of bones had been broken. And along with the skeleton, there was a backpack with a tape recorder inside. The recorder had the following recording. Definitely a pretty eerie thing to listen to knowing that this person may have died afterwards. It's unclear why the man recorded himself yelling, but it's speculated that he may have planned to use the recording to continue yelling for help when his voice gave out. 
And just in case you're wondering what the recording actually said, it was more or less something like, I can't move, I'm on the cliff, help me. But along with this, the man also mentioned a previous helicopter that had been at his location. And something else that I didn't mention earlier is that inside the backpack there was also an ID card. The card belonged to a man named Kenji Iwamura who by all accounts seemed to be relatively reclusive, so him venturing out into the mountains was kind of strange. And another thing that's pretty odd in this incident is that almost all local publications of the case, Kenji's name was redacted. In fact, his name was only ever explicitly mentioned in an American newspaper reporting the strange incident. And next, I'd like to return to the SOS sign. Earlier, I mentioned that it measured in at about 16 feet or 5 meters in height. Many people found it very odd that someone was able to move all of those logs 100 meters from the wooded area by themselves, let alone with broken bones. Furthermore, the logs were chopped, but there was no axe or any sign of any tools that could be found nearby. Police ultimately brought the backpack to Kenji's parents, who did confirm it belonged to Kenji, but they said that they didn't recognize the voice on the recording. They didn't think that the voice sounded like Kenji at all. This could suggest that Kenji was not alone and had either ventured into the mountains with a partner or met another lost hiker along the way. And this could explain how the SOS sign was made. I did leave out quite a few details, so if you did find this entry interesting, Barely Sociable does have a good video covering the topic in detail. If you are a US resident like myself, you may have never heard of Primark as the US only has about a dozen of their stores compared to England's 150 plus. But from what I understood, it's basically a clothing retailer similar to something like H&M. One day in one of the stores located in Colchester, a piece of a human bone was found inside a pair of socks which were also of the same brand. It's believed that the bone used to be part of someone's finger. Police were unsure if the bone was tied to some sort of criminal act as it didn't appear to be a result of a recent incident since it didn't have any leftover skin particles surrounding it. And ever since, the case has never been elevated and a Primark spokesman said that the company has considered the matter closed. So for now, we have no idea who the bone belonged to or why it was even there. On July 4th, 1999, a family visited the San Miguel and Dolores Rivers in western Colorado for a fun-filled day swimming in the waters. But they would be left speechless after making a grim discovery. In some muddy waters nearby, there was a white 1994 Ford F-250 pickup truck. When police caught wind and arrived, they were eager to investigate as this truck could potentially be a lead in another case that the sheriff's department had been working on. Authorities determined that the truck belonged to a man named Dale Williams, who had gone missing about one to two months earlier. But unfortunately, no clues as to the whereabouts of the man were found in the vehicle. Dale was 42 years old at the time of his disappearance and was described as being an active community leader, loyal husband, and loving father. Additionally, Dale owned an auto body shop as well as a few other businesses and buildings in neighboring towns. Dale failed to return home on May 27th of 1999 and initially his wife Diana simply thought that he was swamped with extra work at his body shop. So she and the kids would simply have dinner and not worry about Dale. However, as it got late into the night, Diana grew increasingly concerned. She had called her husband and the body shop multiple times by now with no answer. At this point, Diana was having trouble sleeping as she tossed and turned in bed, waking up very frequently. Every time Diana woke up, she would look through the window to peek at the driveway, but she would never see Dale's vehicle. When the next morning rolled around, she was horrified to learn that Dale was still gone. Diana visited the body shop immediately after dropping her daughters off at school, and she would notice that the door to the shop was left unlocked. While investigating the business, Diana called Dale's mother to see if he had visited her after work and simply forgot to lock the business door. Dale's mother said that she had not heard from him in the past day. And just as an FYI, neither Dale's mother or Diana have contacted police at this point and instead they investigated by themselves. The duo would spend the day visiting multiple locations that Dale frequented, but they found no trace of him. And by the end of the day, they exhausted all of their ideas, so they finally contacted the police. Authorities found out that Dale had stopped by the home of a customer named Tammy. 
Tammy had said that she found it strange that Dale visited her in person to update her on their vehicle. In fact, for some reason, Dale mentioned that he was in a rush and needed to help a stranded motorist before leaving. This detail sort of confused Diana, as the shop didn't own a tow truck nor did it work on internal repairs on vehicles. Dale's family plastered missing posters all over the community and everyone seemed to be eager to help in finding Dale, all except one that is. Only two days after putting up the missing posters, Diana had realized that someone had taken them down. At first, Diana didn't really think much of this and she simply put up more posters. A few days later, they were removed yet again. After police learned about this, they set up a camera and they captured images of a man tearing down the posters who was ultimately identified as a longtime family friend of Dale and Diana. During the questioning, the police learned that this old family friend was angry at Dale for moving his ex-wife to another state without his knowledge after he had shared some information about their abusive relationship. And understandably, after learning this, Diana believed this man to be responsible for Dale's disappearance. It was revealed that after helping this man's ex-wife, Dale found strange items outside of his body shop. Items such as torn up pictures stolen from within the shop, bullets, as well as a revolver that was inside the drop box at a video rental shop that Diana ran. But the man denied being the one who was leaving these items around the family's businesses. Now back to the truck that we mentioned at the beginning of this entry. Through various signs such as the ignition being turned on and the angle at which the truck landed into the water, it was determined that the truck was deliberately steered off road. In fact, police had said that it would have been virtually impossible for anyone to accidentally crash into the water. Oddly enough, the metal toolbox that was bolted in place in the back of the truck was missing. Dive teams were sent to search the surrounding rivers, but they would not be able to find any signs of Dale. And that's about where our mystery ends. It's almost certain that the previously mentioned motorist that was stranded is responsible. Despite witnesses saying that they saw Dale on the highway with his hood up next to another car, the other mystery person has never been identified. Flight 19 was the name of a group of five torpedo bombers that disappeared over the Bermuda Triangle in December of 1945. And this incident in particular is often cited as being the one that kicked off all of the supernatural Bermuda Triangle talks. All 14 airmen were lost as well as the 13 crew members that were sent to search for Flight 19. Initially, Navy investigators determined that flight leader Lieutenant Charles Taylor mixed up small islands when compasses suddenly stopped working, resulting in the flight going in an incorrect direction away from land. However, this report was amended and instead it was said that the flight was lost due to unknown causes. The reason for this change was that the Navy didn't want to blame Lieutenant Taylor for the loss of the men. On the day that Flight 19 went missing, they were simply conducting a routine navigation and combat training exercise. The flight initially headed towards some shoals that were referred to as Chicken Rocks, and this location often served as grounds for low-level bombing practice. After passing these shoals, there were two more legs of the practice route that the flight had to go through, but suddenly the members began contacting each other asking what their compass readings were. Upon checking, they began to realize their equipment was acting out and they had no idea where they were. As the flight members soared through the skies aimlessly, the naval air station eventually got into contact with Lieutenant Taylor, who was told to switch to the search and rescue frequency, but Taylor refused. Lieutenant Taylor was reported to have told his flight crew to head due east for 10 minutes while many of the crew said that simply heading west would take them back home. But due to military discipline, the crew obeyed Taylor. As time went on, the weather got worse and eventually radio contact was entirely lost. The last message from Taylor said the following, All planes close up tight. We'll have to ditch on less landfall. When the first plane drops below 10 gallons, we all go down together. In 1986, the wreckage of an Avenger was found off the Florida coast during the search for the wreckage of the Challenger space shuttle. At first, it was believed that the wreckage belonged to Flight 19, however, this was a mistake. As the decades passed and more wreckages were uncovered, the claims that Flight 19 had been found would increase, but ultimately they would all be debunked and for now, Flight 19 has still not been found. The Connecticut River Valley Killer is the name of an unidentified serial killer that was primarily active during the 1980s and has taken the lives of at least 7 people. 
As the name suggests, the killer mainly worked in the New England region of the United States. Sometime in the mid-1980s, three women disappeared in Claremont, New Hampshire, and the remains of two of them were discovered within a thousand feet of each other. It was difficult to determine the cause of death due to the damage the remains sustained, but a number of factors suggested that they had been stabbed to death, with the killing blows mainly being dealt at or around the head slash neck area. About a week and a half after these two bodies were discovered, a third body had also been found. During the autopsy, it was revealed that this woman also had multiple stab wounds. And during the time that these three bodies were being retrieved, another woman in her mid-30s had also been stabbed to death inside her home in Vermont. At this point, authorities were suspecting that all of these murders could have been linked, so they dug through past homicides near the area and found two cases from 1978 and 1981 that reinforced this idea. After further investigation, authorities found that these killings had similar MOs with the dump sites and the wound patterns of the victims. One of the more notable victims is a woman named Jane Borowski who was 22 years old. Reason why I say this is one of the more notable ones is that it seems the culprit stopped his killing spree after his encounter with Jane. On August 6, 1988, a pregnant Jane Borowski was returning home from a convenience store and once she reached her car, she noticed a man making his way around the back of her vehicle. When she saw this, she frantically got inside, but the man would continue approaching the driver's side window. When he reached it, he tapped on a glass as if to signal Jane to roll down her window. And once it was down, the man accused Jane of beating up his girlfriend before grabbing her and stabbing her 27 times. Afterwards, the mystery man fled to his vehicle and left Jane to die. But somehow, she was still conscious and so she took off onto New Hampshire Route 32 toward her friend's house. Fortunately, Jane did make it to their friend's house and from there they took her to a nearby hospital. Obviously, Jane had sustained immense injuries, but she would survive and her baby was unharmed. Once Jane recovered, she provided police with details on the killer to create a composite sketch. As with many of these murder cases, there are a lot of suspects, but one man by the name of Gary Westover actually confessed to one of the murders before dying. In October 1997, 46-year-old Gary told his uncle, who was a retired sheriff's deputy, that he and three friends abducted, killed, and disposed of a woman named Barbara Agnew. Barbara was supposedly the final victim of this Connecticut killer. Gary's uncle shared this information with authorities, but he felt as though they weren't particularly interested in it. And Gary ultimately died in 1998. Now, it's highly unlikely that Gary himself was the killer as he was actually a paraplegic, but perhaps one of the friends he was with could have been responsible. And as far as I know, none of Gary's buddies were ever followed up on. Another suspect in this case is named Michael Nicolau, who was a man that grew up with a rough childhood. Michael ended up in the military where he would become a helicopter pilot in Vietnam. However, he was discharged from active duty for unlawfully flying his helicopter too low with three soldiers that ended with the murder of numerous civilians. And this wasn't the first account of violence in Michael's life. For the sake of the video, I won't be going over those, but just know that Michael has a tendency to break out in violence. He did eventually marry a woman named Michelle, and it's said that Michelle changed dramatically after meeting Michael. Michael was incredibly possessive and controlling over Michelle, and oftentimes when she left home, Michael would stalk her until she returned. She even said that she wanted to leave the marriage, but feared for her life if she did. In December of 1988, Michelle's family reported her missing, and when police questioned Michael, he said that he never saw her before. But after further questioning, he would admit he had a relationship with her, and he called her that ran off with a Colombian drug dealer. Michael eventually remarried with a woman named Eileen, which resulted in a murder where both Eileen and her daughter would die along with Michael. We have all heard that having strong willpower will greatly benefit our lives, that as long as we have amazing willpower, we can achieve anything. Whether that goal is to fulfill a certain task when we don't feel like it, or to restrain ourselves when we want to change our poor habits. On the surface, you may think that constantly declaring our objective in our minds would be the best way to enhance our willpower and ultimately achieve our goals. However, a study conducted by psychologist Ibrahim Sine from the University of Illinois suggests otherwise. 
Ibrahim took a group of volunteers and had them work on a number of anagrams. Additionally, he had half of the group contemplating whether they would work on the anagrams while the others simply thought about the task of doing the anagrams. If that was a little confusing, basically one group was putting their minds into a sort of standby phase where they only wondered about the task to themselves, and the second group were actively asserting themselves and their will. Ibrahim explained it as one group asking, will I do this, and another group stating, I will do this. And the results were pretty surprising. The group that was left in that sort of standby phase completed significantly more anagrams than the other group that was asserting themselves. Which suggested that those who kept their minds open and not tunnel vision on one task were more motivated than the other group. But why is that? You would think that asserting ourselves and telling ourselves that we will get X done would mean that we will be more productive in our tasks. Ibrahim then conducted another study with a new group, but this time the task was exercise. He found that the group thinking, will I, performed much better overall than the group thinking, I will. When Ibrahim questioned the will I mindset group, they had explanations such as, I want to take more responsibility for my own health, while the I will group had explanations like, I would feel guilty or ashamed of myself if I didn't go to the gym. That first group were more intrinsically motivated to go to the gym. They sought positive inspiration from themselves instead of holding themselves to an unfamiliar standard. On July 20th, 1968, a fishing boat called El Fausto left Tazacorte's port to head towards El Hierro Island. The owner of the boat was named Rafael Acosta, and he employed brothers Ramon and Alberto Hernandez as well as their cousins Miguel and Viterbo Acosta as the crew. All of these men were experienced sailors and fishermen. Although this was a fishing boat, it was much larger than normal so it was often tasked with other work such as transporting fruit and other goods. In a job that they were just assigned, they were carrying explosives which were to be used for agricultural purposes. The previously mentioned crew would all be present except for Viterbo who was preoccupied with a celebration he agreed to attend. It took about 7 hours for the crew to reach Frontera which is around the northern side of El Hierro. When the crew arrived, they began to unload their cargo when they were met by a man named Julio Garcia. Earlier that day, Julio's wife had contacted him, telling him that their two-month-old daughter became severely ill and understandably, Julio became extremely worried. He wanted to return home as soon as possible to take care of his daughter, but he missed the last boat home by minutes. The next boat wouldn't depart for at least another two days. Desperate for a way home, Julio approached El Fausto and asked to accompany them back to La Palma. He even offered to pay the men for the trip. The crew empathized with the father, so they agreed to take him on board without pay. The crew continued offloading their cargo before fetching some fruit for the 8 hour trip to La Palma. They left at about 2.30am on July 21st and little did they know that this would actually be the last time they would ever set foot on land. The group of men had gone through this route numerous times and thought this trip to be no different. The seas were calm and the weather was pretty mundane. Some fishermen did report later on that there was some mist that began to form later that night, but regardless, the experienced crew should have had no problem navigating the waters. The owner of the boat, Rafael, expected the crew to arrive at Tazacorte around 10am, but when the boat failed to show up, he became worryful. In an attempt to calm the nerves of the crew's families, he sent some sailors on the same route that El Fausto had taken in hopes that they would come across Ramon, Miguel, and the rest of the crew. This new group of sailors would radio back to Rafael saying that they had not seen any sign of El Fausto at any point. And at this moment in time, Rafael's mind began racing as to what may have happened to the crew. Could they have been victim to some sort of mechanical failure or did the waters abruptly become violent? Rafael couldn't come up with any sort of reasoning for El Fausto's disappearance. Rafael issued an emergency message to all of his employees and neighboring ships that were in the vicinity. Despite the optimal weather and aircraft that were used, the ship was still not spotted anywhere. And at this point, Rafael was on the brink of mentally collapsing. Perhaps the ship had sunk, but if it didn't, the crew and Julio would likely be dead in about a week considering that they had very little food. 
On July 25th, Raphael finally received some good news. The crew of the Duquesa reportedly found El Fausto in the Atlantic Ocean when traveling from South America to the Netherlands. The crew were doing well, but oddly refused Duquesa's offer of towing them to Tazacorte. But they did accept food, fuel, and cigarettes before they each went their separate ways. This set of events sparked much speculation, making some believe that the crew of the Duquesa actually lied. Or at the very least, they were not revealing all all that they saw. On another account on October 9th of the same year, the crew to an Italian ship called Ana di Mayo reported finding Al Fausto. And when first mate Ascione boarded Al Fausto, he said he saw a dead man who was partly mummified clutching a transistor radio in the engine room. Apparently, this man was Julio. Ascione also said that he was the only person on the ship. There was no trace of the other men. There were no signs of violence or any damage either. The crew ultimately secured Al Fausto with a cable and attempted to tow it to Venezuela. Key word, attempted as the cable reportedly snapped, causing Al Fausto to sink. This story, like any other account of ships going missing at sea, is really strange and eerie. The thought of being lost in the expansive domain of the ocean is just terrifying in my opinion. Let me know what you think happened to the crew in the comments below. When I was searching around for possible theories, I couldn't really find any that I felt were worthy of being communicated with you guys. Most of the theories I came across were kind of far-fetched, but there were some people who suggested that Al Fausto got tied up in illegal activities. So this entry, like some other entries in this iceberg, seems to be a solved mystery, but since it's obscure and short, I thought I'd cover it anyway. The El Tannin Antenna, I believe is how you say it, is an object that was photographed in 1964 on the sea floor near the Antarctic research ship USNS El Tannin. It was located about 13,000 feet deep, and most scientists believe that the strange antenna-like structure to be some sort of carnivorous sponge, while other theorists suggested that it was some sort of extraterrestrial artifact. However, in 2003, the object was officially identified as this thing. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce this, but this indeed was a carnivorous sponge. So finally, we have gotten to one of the serial pooper entries on this iceberg. For whatever reason, there is quite a large amount of people on this iceberg that just can't resist taking a fat out in public. Sometime in 2016, residents of a small village within the state of Ohio called Ohio City were complaining about these random turds that would show up in their yards. This eventually spread from people's yards to walkways in front of local businesses. One Ohio City local said, I have found wads of poop and I have had to clean it up myself. Another local said, you call 911 and say, hey man, I see somebody in somebody's yard. They taken a trow or a dump. They taken a urine. By the time police come, they probably be gone. According to the local police, nobody has ever submitted an official complaint and they never have come across an individual in the act before. Beowulf is an extremely long story that is often cited as one of the most important pieces of text in Old English literature. The manuscript itself is in a very fragile condition and is difficult to preserve. If you are unaware of the story, I'll give a brief synopsis. The story focuses on a young warrior that is on his way to aid the King of the Danes whose kingdom is being invaded by the forces of a monster called Grendel. Beowulf succeeds in slaying Grendel and from there proceeds to slay Grendel's mother. There is peace for about 50 years before a dragon emerges. Beowulf, tasked with killing the beast, sets off and succeeds in slaying it but dies afterwards. The manuscript itself was damaged in a fire in 1731 when it was stored within the Ashburnham house. Pieces of of the poem were lost in this fire, including an excerpt that details the climactic fight between Beowulf and the dragon. Although the story itself can still be understood without difficulty, it's also suspected that this tale was originally passed down verbally and at some point in time, someone decided to write it down. And because of this, it's very likely that pieces of the story were lost or skewed as it spread by mouth. The missing pieces of the story are one of the greatest mysteries of English literature.
On October 15, 1995, a private investigator named Phil Harris reported hearing a disembodied voice while sleeping in his chair. The voice told Phil that his name was David Chase and that he was murdered. David wanted Phil to investigate his murder and to buy the Sunday paper. Phil obviously thought that this was some sort of crazy dream. But after some digging, Phil was shocked to find out that a man named David Chase had drowned about four months before Phil heard his voice in his head. David's wife, Judy, was convinced that he was murdered as well. Phil believed that he was quote unquote chosen to solve David's case and when he approached Judy to take it on, she would not accept. But after Phil gave her details only David and her would have known, Judy caved in. The deal itself was kind of strange as Phil said he would investigate the case until it was solved for only a dollar. David and Judy lived in Evergreen, Colorado for a year and a half and were planning to adopt two foster kids that were already living with them. David was scheduled to work on a roofing job with a man named Matt Orohosk on June 6th, 1995. The two men finished their work around noon that day and decided to go out for lunch. Afterwards, David stopped by a bank to cash a $1,800 check. While David was at the bank, he and Matt were discussing what they should do for the rest of the day and the duo decided to visit a local bar. Once the night came around, Judy became anxious as David had yet to return home. This was incredibly out of character for him, but Judy ultimately forced herself to bed thinking that David just had extra work. By the next morning, Judy knew something bad had happened as David was still missing. She knew that David was working with Matt the previous day, so she immediately drove over to his house. Matt told Judy that he left the bar before David and he last saw him shooting pool. Judy later stated that Matt's girlfriend called her later that morning, saying the following. David had said, oh, I'm going for a swim, I've got a raft. When Judy learned about this, she was completely bewildered. David was a very experienced mountain climber with knowledge on hyperthermia and with the weather getting cold, Judy believed David knew better than to jump into snow-fed rivers. So now Judy had two different stories, one of which she found impossible to believe. Matt had told her David was at the bar while Matt's girlfriend said David went for a swim. Judy did not trust Matt at all at this point and decided to go to the police. Police questioned Matt and he gave the same answer of David going for a swim. Despite Judy's suspicions of Matt, it's not like the police were able to lock him up or anything and so they would just get to searching around the vicinity in hopes to find David alive. Six weeks after David's initial disappearance, his lifeless body was found in the Bear Creek River about three miles downstream from where he was last seen. The autopsy reported that David had drowned to death which did support Matt's swimming story, but of course Judy was still skeptical. Reason for this was because David's neck was broken and there were strange cuts along both of his legs. Additionally, his clothes were ripped from his body and only bits of them remained. After the autopsy, police questioned Matt once more and this time he would make two changes in his story. Now his account went like this. Matt and David left the bar and drove down the street to dispose of some brush that they were hauling from their job. And instead of David voluntarily jumping into the river, he supposedly fell in this time. Judy then wondered if this was an accident, why didn't Matt just get help? A fire station was about 50 yards away and in less than a minute they could have gotten to David's location. Gradually, people began to think that David's death was not an accident and was instead murder. After three months of investigation, Phil returned to Judy saying that David had been speaking to him quite frequently. The apparent ghost of David told Phil that Matt urged him into cashing the $1,800 check instead of depositing it under the guise of David purchasing Matt's truck. David, however, was having second thoughts on purchasing the vehicle, which apparently made Matt furious. Matt said things like, you promised to buy the truck, so that money is mine. You owe it to me. Matt even got physical, shoving David in the chest. This ultimately turned into a brawl where Matt and David exchanged blows to the face. This fight eventually made its way to the river, where David was struck in the nape with a blunt object. Of course, take all of this with a grain of salt as this is all supposedly from a ghost of David that is speaking to Phil from the dead. For all we know, Phil might just have made all of this up. On June 7th, 1996, Phil took Judy to a local reservoir, saying that the murder weapon and David's bloody clothes were dumped there. In a shocking turn of events, Phil died of a heart attack a week after visiting that reservoir. And unfortunately, this is kind of where our mystery stands. After Phil's death, Judy was left all alone to investigate and overall the entire case is just strange and some parts are understandably tough to believe. 
Matt never ended up being charged with anything and police are at a standstill as there is very little if any evidence to use. Let me know what you think of this entry in the comments down below. I am really interested in what you guys think. Okay, so I'll try and keep this entry short as you all know about Bigfoot. It's the towering ape-like creature that has been sighted in forests across North America. The vast majority of scientists consider the existence of Bigfoot to be irrational. Instead, skeptics believe that Bigfoot is just an amalgamation of folklore, misidentification, and fear. The cryptid got its name after a logging company's employee came across some oddly large tracks in the woods. The tracks were about 16 inches in length and were oddly human-like. The worker began telling his peers about the tracks and they began saying that they too saw similar tracks across the woods but had no idea what left them. The sightings in combination with local tales of large hairy wild men ushered the Bigfoot creature into popular culture. As I said earlier, many skeptics believe the Bigfoot sightings are just a form of misidentification. Perhaps instead of an actual Bigfoot, it was some sort of phantom ape. Earlier in the iceberg, we went over many topics regarding phantom animals such as kangaroos, big cats, etc. So I don't think it's absurd to think that maybe someone's illegal pet ape may have escaped and wandered around forests. Throughout history, a number of gravediggers reported cases of corpse quakes. In case you have never heard of this term before, it's basically when someone begins to shake violently while at a graveyard. One gravedigger who worked at the Cypress Hill Cemetery for 15 years said that he has seen this phenomenon a number of times. For example, on one occasion where he was working with three other diggers, one of them who was previously a lively individual suddenly became more reserved. They were scheduled to dig a grave for a funeral held on the same day, but as soon as a young man stuck his spade into the ground, his body began to shake. Even when he set his tools aside, his arms and body would not stop moving. A few days later, his co-workers also began experiencing these corpse quakes, which ultimately forced them to stop working. And when these employees completely stepped away from the work and quit, they were miraculously cured of the shaking. Jennifer Fairgate is an unidentified woman who died in 1995, but the name Jennifer Fairgate isn't the woman's real name. The reasoning for her death and her true identity are still unresolved. There are a number of theories as to who the woman was, ranging from being a serial killer to a mentally unwell criminal. There are even some people who heavily favor the idea that she was some sort of spy. Sometime towards the beginning of June 1995, Fairgate checked into the Plaza Motel in Oslo. Oddly enough, she was able to get a room without any identification, and later investigations showed that she misspelled her name as Fergate multiple times when checking in. Furthermore, it's rumored that Jennifer arrived with a person named Lois Fairgate, who promptly left after Jennifer obtained her room. About three to four days after Jennifer had obtained her room, the staff realized that it didn't have a card associated with it, so they sent some people to check the room. Upon arriving, they found a do not disturb sign on the door, which reportedly had been up for the past few days. As if on cue, when one of the employees knocked on the door, a gunshot went off inside the room. The employee then ran off and returned about 15 minutes later with security. The door was double bolted from the inside, and the room had a rancid odor as well. On top of the bed was Jennifer's lifeless body with a gun nearby. The weapon was found out to be mainly used by the military and high-level criminals. At first, this case was labeled as a due to the obvious evidence found inside the hotel room, but as police investigated further, they began to question themselves. When police went through Jennifer's luggage, they realized she had no purse, no ID, no passport, and no credit card or money at all. Additionally, the only clothing Jennifer brought were all black tops, and she didn't bring anything to wear on her lower body besides what she already had on. As we previously established, Jennifer had no ID and she never paid for the room, so it's unclear how exactly Jennifer got it. When police went to check with guests staying nearby, they found out that there was a strange Belgian man that stayed in the room across from Jennifer who constantly peeked out and roamed around the floor. This man checked out of the hotel the night before Jennifer's death. Police ultimately found this man, but as far as I know, his identity was never released to the public and he was released from any suspicions. The security footage in the hotel was never revealed by investigators and ultimately almost all of the evidence was either lost or destroyed. The case was relabeled as a and Jennifer was buried inside an unmarked grave. 
At some point, Jennifer's case was picked up by a Norwegian journalist named Lars Wegner, who was convinced that Jennifer's death was not a suicide. Lars ultimately tracked down the address that Jennifer gave the hotel to a small village in Belgium, Verlaine, that had a population of about 4,000. Lars provided a photo of Jennifer to the locals, and they all said that they did not recognize the woman. Seemingly at a dead end, Lars returned to Oslo, and while the security footage was never reviewed or archived, he was able to obtain a log of every time a keycard was used to enter X room. Through reviewing the log, Lars found out that Jennifer spent most of her time inside the room. But there was one large gap where Jennifer left that spanned across Thursday and Friday before her death on Saturday. It was reported that cleaning staff had entered the room on Thursday afternoon and found it empty and Jennifer wouldn't return until Friday morning. The span of time outside of the room totaled to about 20 hours, suggesting that Jennifer was either staying somewhere else or had been wandering Oslo non stop. After over two decades of investigating the case, Lars came to two possible theories, both of which suggested that Jennifer was part of the criminal underworld. The first theory says that she was heavily involved in international smuggling, while the second proposes that she was some sort of highly sought after sex worker. Both of these can potentially explain Jennifer's long stint outside of the hotel, as well as her violent end. Lars also believes that the strange man across from Jennifer may have acted as some sort of advisor or accomplice that periodically checked in on Jennifer. The most commonly believed theory amongst not only professional investigators but also internet sleuths is that Jennifer was some sort of international spy or contract killer who was executed for failing a task. And supposedly during this time, the hotel was host to some international negotiations between high-ranking officials from Israel and Palestine. Some people believe Jennifer was somehow tied in these negotiations. Brain in a vat is a scenario in philosophy that is often used in a number of different thought experiments arguing for solipsism. This hypothesis paints a picture of a person being a disembodied brain living in a vat of nutrients. The brain would be connected to a computer of sorts which is capable of stimulating the brain in ways that are more or less the same as a brain within a skull when the body interacts with external objects. And if this form of stimulation is the only way of interacting with the environment, then the brain can't tell if it's in a skull or a vat. The experiment goes on to say that if one cannot know if it is in a vat or a skull, then it is also impossible to tell if one's beliefs are completely false or not. So this entry is a very obscure one that only has ever had one sighting as far as I know. Fluorescent Freddy is a Bigfoot-like creature that was sighted by several teenagers in a wooded area in Indiana in 1965. The humanoid creature was about 10 feet tall and covered in bright green hair with glowing red eyes. And that's pretty much the only information out there on this cryptid. Due to the lack of info, many are skeptical even amongst cryptid enthusiasts. This entry refers to animals that have been reportedly found alive after being encased in solid material such as rock or wood. Most commonly, these animals are frogs or toads. Scientists have more or less dismissed this phenomenon since the 19th century, but there have been experiments in the early 1800s that involved encasing toads inside stones to see how long they could survive. An English geologist named William Buckland placed toads of differing sizes into carved out chambers inside limestone and sealed the rocks before burying them. After a year, William dug them back out and found that most of the toads had died. However, there were a few that survived, but there were small cracks in the stones that housed the surviving toads, which William thought may have allowed for insects to pass. William resealed the rocks with the surviving toads and buried them once more. Once another year had passed, William unearthed them and found that they have all decayed. He then concluded that any accounts of finding animals alive while being entombed were mistaken. In modern times, most scientists declare any account of entombed animals to be a hoax. The Chicago Tylenol murders was a series of poisoning deaths resulting from drug tampering that took place in 1982. There were seven total deaths and it was found that all the victims had taken Tylenol branded capsules that had been laced with potassium cyanide. The deaths began on September 29th where a 12 year old Mary Kellerman passed away after consuming a capsule of extra strength Tylenol. A man named Adam Janis died the same day as Mary in a hospital after also taking some Tylenol. Adam's brother Stanley and sister-in-law Teresa also 
also died after they took Tylenol from the same bottle. Within a week, Mary McFarland, Paula Prince, and Mary Reiner would all die in similar scenarios. Once authorities figured out that Tylenol was the reason for the deaths, there were immediate warnings aired on various media outlets urging residents to discontinue use of any Tylenol products. It was found that the tampered capsules came from two manufacturing centers, one in Pennsylvania and one in Texas. This suggests that the capsules may have been tainted in store or some time after they left their facilities. Along with the previously mentioned warnings on Tylenol products, Johnson & Johnson halted all production and advertising as well, which ultimately led to a nationwide recall. No one has ever been charged with the murders, but a man named James William Lewis is one of the more notorious suspects. James was accused of issuing a letter out to Johnson & Johnson where he requested $1 million or else the attacks would continue. James was arrested, tried, and convicted of extortion and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. And you would probably expect this case to end here. But there are many people who believe that James was not the culprit as there was no hard evidence to charge him with. James was just a really, really stupid person trying to take advantage of the situation and for whatever reason, he thought he could come out on top $1 million richer. After James was arrested, he then denied any responsibility for the Tylenol poisonings. This entry is a cold case revolving around a man named Johnny Joe Shields who lived in Iowa. And after some digging, there really isn't too much detail that has ever been revealed about the case. Johnny was a white male, about 5 foot 6 inches tall, and about 160 pounds. He disappeared at the age of 32 in December of 1988 in Carter Lake, Iowa. When Johnny went missing, he left behind his pickup truck and all of his belongings, and his bank account has not had any activity since his disappearance. And it's said that Johnny worked at a fish market as well. That is quite literally all I could find. There was mention that Johnny was taken against his will, but I couldn't find specific details on why that conclusion was made. The Queensland tiger is a popular creature in Australian folklore. The animal is described as being a dog-sized feline with stripes and a long tail. It has been hypothesized to be a descendant of the large carnivorous marsupial Thylacolio, which is considered to be extinct. If you recall from one of the earlier parts of this iceberg, we had an entry on Tasmanian tigers, which are said to be extinct as well. But despite that, there are a number of people who reported to have seen them roaming around Australia. And these Queensland tigers look quite similar, just differing in size is all. So that's going to be it for today's video. Thank you so much if you made it all the way to the end. And as of recording this, it is January 2nd. So happy new year to all of you. I hope you guys had an amazing Christmas as well. And I hope in this year that you guys get one step closer to achieving your goals. And lastly, thank you guys all so much for the support in 2022. At the start of last year, I had no idea I was going to even start a YouTube channel, let alone actually have people watching my videos. So I really can't express how... Uh, thankful I am for the time that you guys are spending watching my contents and just the overall support you guys are showing me. So I hope for this year you guys continue to bear with me as I learn and grow and try to become a better content creator. So one last time, thank you guys so so much and happy new year to you all.